I'm Nicholas Rydow. I'm Professor of Theatre in the Department of Drama. Um, I've been at Queen Mary since 2002. Um, my work for a long time now has been mainly about the particular encounter that happens in a theatre where one group of people, conventionally, sits in the dark during its leisure time watching another group of people in the light while working. Uh, and I guess in some ways nearly everything I've written has been about attempts to explore that situation, the politics of that situation, the history of it, the aesthetics uh, involved. And my current work is really now trying to develop a much more detailed, extended and richer history of that situation, which is not, yeah, it's a situation that's historically specific, it's one that's very familiar to us now from the theatres that many of us are most used to going to, but it's not the only way in which theatre happens, and theatre happens in many other ways in different cultures and at different historical moments. So my interest at the moment is really trying to trace how it was that that particular setup, if you like, that I sometimes call the modern theatre, or the bourgeois theatre, uh, came into being in the first place. is a book provisionally entitled Scenes from Bourgeois Life uh, and the idea about that is to do I guess two or three things. One, trace the history as I've already suggested of that situation of the bourgeois theatre, how did it come into being and in particular to trace it back to a moment in this country at least in English or British history, uh, a moment in the early 18th century when an emerging class, uh, which becomes the middle class or the bourgeoisie, uh, begins to participate publicly in a whole set of interconnected leisure activities, of which theatre is part, but going out to coffee houses and chatting is another part of it. Smoking is another part of it. Um, one of the things that emerges from looking at that moment is a recognition that it's part the theatre in that moment is part of an emerging consumer culture in which a new class of people are beginning to have the kind of disposable income that will enable them to spend it on these kinds of leisure activities. And that also the reason that they have that disposable income is because of major changes in the economic structure of their society. And one huge aspect of those major changes is what we call the colonial relation, which makes itself visible in very, very particular ways in some of the products that are circulating in that new consumer society. For example, tobacco and coffee chocolate also, all of which are products which are brought to this island uh, in the context of colonial appropriation and are almost invariably the products of slave labour. So what I'm trying to trace here is the relationship between that colonial capitalism, slave labour and the growing leisure society of which theatre is becoming part. I'm, I'm going to be in two places. First I'm going to be at the Huntington Library which is in Los Angeles uh, in, in the next academic year and the, the year after that I'll be a fellow at an international research centre at the Freie Universität in Berlin which is devoted to the subject of interweaving performance cultures. And I'll be doing slightly different parts of the same project in these two situations. So to start with Los Angeles, it may seem strange, but I will be looking almost exclusively at British material while I'm in Los Angeles. I guess part of the reason for this is that libraries like the Huntington, which, are, which is where I will be, uh, which have uh, large endowments which have enabled them to build up important collections and archival holdings. There is a, you know, simply a kind of wealth um, being devoted to such archives and collections in the United States where there is obviously a strong historic interest in 
British culture. So actually significant collections of British cultural historical material are to be found in collections in the States, such as at the Huntington. And in particular, at the Huntington, I'm interested, um, among a range of other things, in looking at uh, a collection of over 2,000 play manuscripts that they hold. Um, and these plays, it's called the Larpunt Collection. Uh, and the plays that are in that collection were manuscripts that were submitted to the Lord Chancellor in London um, for approval. The Lord Chancellor basically was a, a censor who until 1968 had to approve the text of every play that was publicly presented. Um, so there are these two and a half thousand or so manuscripts that were submitted between I think the dates are something like 1737 to 1844 um, for government approval. Uh, some of these will be plays that we're familiar with because they have been published and they were produced, there were performances in theatres. Others in fact will be largely unknown, will never have been published, may never have actually ever been performed. And I'm particularly interested in tracing through that period of about a hundred years uh, how the theatre itself makes the colonial relation that I've been talking about part of its own subject matter. So we find that th in, in, uh, in the British theatre of the 17th and 18th century and then moving on into the early 19th century there is a strand of plays which are specifically about the process of colonization. There are plays about how the Spaniards conquered parts of South America and their plays in which the heroes are um, indigenous people, indigenous rulers from South America. But also there are plays which, um, and I, there are a number of them I can think of that are in the Larpent collection, which are specifically about the British colonial experience, particularly in the Caribbean. Uh, plays with titles such as The Benevolent Plantation uh, so I want to look at these plays as a way of beginning to understand how the people who are involved in this emerging leisure economy as theatre goers come to understand their relationship with that colonial process, with the experience of slavery. So to, to try and get a sense of how that culture, which is made possible by slavery and colonial expropriation, how that culture thinks about itself in relation to those things. So that's what I'll be doing mainly in, in LA, although it's also very fortuitous that the Huntington is one collection which holds one of the complete sets of The Spectator, which was a famous newspaper um, produced in the early 18th century. It was a daily newspaper that came out um, between 1710 and 1711, which is a very important part of that consumer culture that the theatre is also part of and has lots of writing about the kind of stuff that is happening in the coffee houses, on the stages, in the London where this consumer culture is taking shape. So I'll be looking at, um, at that material and related material uh, at the Huntington. Research Centre. Uh, it's been going for quite a while at the Fry Universitat. Um, has you know has had a series of I think phases of funding um, to support primarily the work of fellows who come for varying lengths of time I think to work in the centre. And I'll be one of those for the academic year 2017-18. Uh, continuing to work on some of the same material. Um, but I guess the important thing there is less the presence of a collection and archival materials that I'll be working on, more, if you like, the intellectual environment. So in, whereas in, uh, in Los Angeles at the Huntington, the other fellows who will be in residence may be historians or uh, literary theorists and critics, literary historians and so on, not necessarily people who are concerned as I am with theatre and performance. In Berlin, my, the other fellows will be people working on theatre and performance and then particularly they'll be doing so in uh, a context which is all about thinking about the relationships between people of different cultures and the way in which 
uh, what we might call cultures of theatre and performance are shaped by those cultural interactions. So in that context, obviously, one of the, since my project is to think about how a performance culture, a performance culture of theatre going in London from the 18th century to the present day has been shaped by interactions with the range of cultures with whom uh, the British bourgeoisie came into contact as part of the colonial experience. Uh, that's, you know, that's why my work is properly suited to the, the, um, the aims of the research centre in Berlin. And it's also why it will be extremely valuable to be spending time with other scholars who themselves will be coming from a range of different cultures, backgrounds, countries with different languages and different kinds of experiences, different traditions of performance, so that I can begin to think about my work in relation to other people thinking about cultural interactions and cultural relations of that kind. First, I think just simply by being part of a group of people who will have come together from many different places, that, that simply those encounters personally and professionally are likely to, to bring me into contact with ideas and ways of thinking and material that I would never have encountered before and that's going to be enormously valuable and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, then Berlin itself obviously, it's a city I visited quite a lot for a short short periods of time uh, and uh, is culturally extremely stimulating and in particular has a very exciting um, mainstream theatre. One of the things that's very striking uh, in Berlin is that some of the most experimental work is done on some of the main stages, say for example at a, a theatre like the Volksbühne. Um, work that is in many respects far more experimental than much work that happens in the UK and so being, being you know, regularly exposed to that kind of performance on my doorstep will be fantastic. Then I think there's a, another thing which is, for me, uh, important uh, about Berlin, uh, which probably relates to some of my earlier work, particularly in my, my last book, Passionate Amateurs, where I draw quite strongly on the work of a um, German, and in fact Berlin, initially Berlin, born and brought up uh, philosopher and, and, and critical thinker, Walter Benjamin. Um, and Benjamin is part of, uh, if you like, an intellectual environment uh, in Berlin in the first part of the, the, the 20th century, which for all sorts of reasons has um, provided sort of theoretical and critical foundations for many of the ways in which I think about culture. Um, I suppose also one of the things about being in Berlin uh, is that it you know, is a way of maintaining uh, a set of intellectual relationships with uh, education and research in Europe, uh, which is an important dimension of the work that happens in the School of English and Drama and in the Drama Department uh, and uh, needs to remain so. Uh, it's really valuable that you know when I'm teaching a class uh, here at Queen Mary that I might look around a, a group of 15 or 20 students in a seminar and realize that there are students in the room from Germany, Russia, Ukraine, Czech Republic and Hungary. Um, they're a vital part of the intellectual and scholarly and creative community here um, and they enrich the work that we do and to, to uh, not have those kind of European and indeed wider intellectual international uh, connections as part of our everyday life would be a, you know, a serious loss to the, the quality of uh, experience here. I, I'm uh, Brexit notwithstanding, I am relatively optimistic that we will be able to maintain that. Um, here at Queen Mary. Uh, it's a university that has committed itself very uh, substantially to uh, an international approach to education and research um, and I think that will continue. I have to say actually I'm doubtful that Brexit as it is currently imagined by those who claim to support it will actually happen. That may be the, uh, the uh, ever optimistic part of me um, but I, I, you know, I think in a couple of years time we, we may be looking at a, a slightly less uh, cut and dried and devastating situation than we seem to be facing now.
so yes, it, I think always these things are a trade-off. At some level, of course, uh, for many of us who are engaged in long-term research projects, the opportunity to spend time devoted more or less exclusively to the research involved in those projects, it looks like, well, that's the absolutely ideal thing. What could possibly be better? Um, but um, I do have here at Queen Mary among undergraduate students, PhD students and my colleagues in the drama department, people with whom I'm in regular conversation and conversations that's based on long experiences of those conversations. Uh, so for example recently, uh, as an example of the kind of thing that we can do here as a result of um, being together at Queen Mary. Uh, I was involved in a, a seminar that ran over a couple of weeks, uh, led by a visiting uh, professor from, in fact, from Los Angeles, as it happens, uh, where a group of us, colleagues in the drama department and PhD students, read a series of texts together and discussed them in real detail over a series of four three-hour seminars. And that kind of activity uh, yes, of course, can be replicated with groups of people who have come together for the first time in locations like Los Angeles or Berlin, but actually um, they really are, are about what happens in the institution where you have worked long term, and I shall miss the opportunities to do that kind of work.